Travelog History Special. I'm your host Yan Ling. We're ambitious enough to take you through the stream of Chinese ancient civilization, and stopping this time at a very brief one, Sui Dynasty. Although short-lived, lasted only about 38 years. Sui Dynasty reunified China after 400 years division in China, and laid a solid foundation for the further prosperity of Grand Han Dynasty. And it was during this time. This city, Yangzhou, came into vogue thanks to one project in world class, world's longest man-made waterway, the Grand Canal. Although short-lived, Sui is significant in Chinese history. China was reunited after turbulent period, and the political unity under the Sui made it possible. To build the Grand Imperial Canal, stretching more than thousand miles, the Grand Canal far surpasses the next two great canals of the world, the Suez and Panama. It played the key role, like Niles did for Egypt. The Grand Canal was built and rebuilt. In different areas, in different dynasties in China, since 2,000 years back, but it wasn't until Sui Dynasty that it was finally linked all together, connecting from Hangzhou all the way to Beijing, linking North and South China into one water system. And Yangzhou, as the most important transportation hinge, became the center of both commerce and culture. In China's cultural iconography. Yangzhou implies a personality imbued with poetic melancholy, even a gender. Yes, a sophisticated lady of grace and charm. At its peak time, Yangzhou was also synonymous with fortune and life of comfort, and attracted numerous artists, men of letters. Wealthy merchant families, overseas visitors, and even the most powerful men of the country, emperors, and they all came through one route: the Grand Canal. It says Emperor Qianlong, an eminent emperor of Qing Dynasty, also known for being a Renaissance man of letters, visited Yangzhou many times, both publicly and privately, and left enough anecdotes for today's boat tour talks. We just disembarked from the Royal Harbor. I'm taking a dragon bone. You know, in ancient time, even wearing yellow, the symbolic color of emperor and royal family, is forbidden. But today, of course, you can get the treatment, royal treatment. What a ride! Lasted only 38 years, the Sui Dynasty had only two emperors: Emperor Wen Di and his son Emperor Yang. Traditionally, Emperor Yang is portrayed as a merciless ruler and is criticized for his luxurious lifestyle and his cruelty to the people. The Grand Canal project was massively operated during his reign and completed at great human and economic cost. Look at this! No wonder Emperor Qianlong came to Yangzhou six times, all the way from Beijing. Through the Grand Canal to Yangzhou, you wonder why? The name of Slender West Lake poses a challenge upon China's most famous lake, the West Lake in Hangzhou. Among those who have been to the boats, I have to admit, although less famous, Slender West Lake leads the rival. Slender West Lake, on top of its beauty, the weeping willows, adding more soft touch to it. Weeping by the two banks, the Song Yangdi loved it so much, he gave them a royal family name, Yang.
Although Yangzhou people like to claim the emperor came here six times merely for the beautiful scenery, I believe must be one of the reasons, but he also came here for work doing inspection tour. Because by Chinese law and Chinese tradition, the trade of salt, the, we call it white gold, always been monopolized by the state for the national security reason. But the businessmen always know how to adapt to law. And when the inspectors come here, what do you need to do as a businessman? Of course, to please him and do it seamlessly. Once Emperor Qianlong remarked that this spot bear the resemblance of Beihai Park, only a pity that there were no white stupa to be found. The zealous local salt merchants worked through a night to carve out a stupa from salt and managed to please Emperor next day. The permanent variation that stands here today was built after the Emperor's visit. That reveals the power and wealth of Yangzhou salt merchants once enjoyed. In the 18th century, Yangzhou was at its height of wealth and glory. Most famous Yangzhou gardens built at that time also belonged to those wealthy salt merchants and local officials. Since most natural rivers in China run west-east, to build a man-made waterway linking south north part of China has always been on central government's agenda since the spring-autumn period. But it was during Sui Dynasty that ambitious plan was finally fully recognized, and the canal stretches more than 1,000 miles linked the Yellow and Yangtze River system finally. And the system integrated the north and the south and formed the basis for a unified national economy. It also restored the authority of the imperial officials who were needed for the administration and maintenance of the canal. Until the railways were built in the 20th century, the Grand Canal would continue to be main north-south means of transportation in China. The He Garden was formerly the residence of a Qin minister to France, surnamed He, a traditional Chinese upper-class family that's greatly influenced and found of European bourgeois. The house combines Chinese aesthetics and Western functionality, was designed to cater this owner's personal taste. The east part of the garden serves as an atrium, and the western part as a dwelling. Although a westernized house doesn't necessarily mean a modern way of living. One, two, three. Guess what this is for? The master of the house may appear to be westernized and modern. He may bought this gramophone installed open fire in a dining room. But as far as the domestic rule goes, it's still rather traditional, let's say. The lady of the house are almost confined in the house. So even the lunch is delivered by this way. Never even go downstairs. It's delivered by a bucket. The He family moved to Shanghai in the early 20th century, when the Grand Canal lost its practical function, and Yangzhou, the prosperous late imperial city, fell behind Shanghai, China's first modern cosmopolitan city. Among different schools of Chinese architecture, Yangzhou Garden distinguishes itself from that of Suzhou and Hangzhou as being a balanced combination of southern and northern styles. Also designed by Shi Tao, the Ge Garden used to be the private garden of a Qin government general surnamed Huang, who was in charge of the salt industry in Jiangsu and five neighboring provinces. Ge Yun Garden is famous for its piled rockeries and 40-something kinds of bamboo plants. Huang gave his garden an odd name, Ge Yuan, 
look at the shape of the bamboo leaves. You probably understand why. Huang seems to be a very successful businessman, but also definitely a literacy wannabe. And playing character and word game has always been a favorite game among Chinese poets. And Ge Yuan is famous for being one garden host four seasons. Let's find out why. This is claimed to be the longest corridor in China, but of course not by sheer size. It's only like 40 meters or so. But think about it: walking through this corridor, you walk from the summer scene to the autumn scene. Three months. In Chinese tradition, gardens and miniature landscapes inside a residence were designed both for play and display. The summer hill is supposed to forge the shape of the ever-changing cloud in summer. So uh, imagine yourself walking in a cloud. Voila, the mini tour, mini tour of summer little palace of Huang, the dining room, table and seats. Of course, over here, the bedroom. Take a little nap. Here's a little even a uh, stone pillow. Of course, this is my favorite corner. Look at this, the study. Like a poem or something. Sitting here reminds me of a very famous saying about money. It says, "If you know how to use it, you really can buy happiness and enjoyment." And Huang is definitely a master of art of living. Think about it. Just for some summer shades, he created such a little palace. Luckily, today you don't need to own a fortune to see such a beautiful place. Chinese literacy value two things in life: read and travel. It says after traveling thousands of miles, reading thousands of books. You cannot. It's difficult to be an unwise man. I guess I'm, that's what I'm trying to preach and practice. Yang Zhou's culture bloom had a lot to thank for city's prosperous economy that brought by the Grand Canal, that in turn became the essence of the city. Chinese沉重,沉在原中,是你们到扬州最直接的感受。但是书卷气,书卷气,才是我们的文化气氛。这种城市的内在的气质。你一定要先汇几句诗才可以来扬州,才配一些。所以说在诗词歌赋里面,
the liberal atmosphere, freedom of expression, allowed artists to focus on expressing their own feelings, and created work that breaks away from traditional way of thinking and working. You have a master of art or living. You really have to polish skills in four treasures of study: Qin to play a musical instrument, Qi to uh, play a chess, sharpen your mind. And good at calligraphy and painting to cultivate your taste and senses, of course. But that's also more considered to be the orthodox school and more traditional style. And Yangzhou eight peculiar painters, you know, for their innovative spirit, they of course would like to pursue something slightly different. Known as the Yangzhou Eight Eccentrics, with Zheng Banqiao as best-known representative, this group of artists were initially scholar painters who followed the literary tradition in their artistic pursuit, and later turned to be professional painters. Art was no longer a means of self-cultivation, but a product that can make a living off. The principle of true to life is also followed by Yangzhou Baguai peculiar painters, but they don't take it literally. Paint according to observation. They paint according to their subjective insight and recognition. And their subjects are usually not limited to moon, flowers, mountain, river. They also like to cover some even subject like lower class lifestyle. And Huang Shen is famous even doing the ghost painting. Considered to be setting example for the first generation cartoon. In order to provide a unifying political base for the Sui Dynasty's rule, Emperor Wen Di looked to China's past. Following patterns first established during the Han Dynasty, Wen Di centralized the government bureaucracy and re-established a civil service exam system to maximize political efficiency. He also standardized a system of weights, measures, and currency. The social and cultural reunification of China, however, would require more than military skill and might. Regional and ethnic differences have been a fact of Chinese life for far too long. In order to provide a shared religious and philosophical base for the newly unified country, Sui leaders encouraged the growth and spread of Buddhist thought and practice that found its way from India to China during the Han Dynasty. Under the patronage of the Sui emperors, the number of temples monks in China increased dramatically, and important Chinese schools of Buddhist thought emerged. In 1973, a memorial hall was built within the Daming Temple. Honoring Tianjin and commemorating the renewed friendship between China and Japan. In its high days, Yangzhou relations with its hinterland was similar to Venice in many ways: a city of culture, glitzy wealth, and an international flair. Marco Polo was station official in Yangzhou for many years, and many foreign visitors, like Pu Hating from Nairobi, Cui Ji from Korea. To name a few, also chose to live and study in Yangzhou. There's a well, there's a way. Sounds like a, almost too positive cliche. But for the soft-spoken and iron-minded monk Tianzhen, it's only crystal clear fact. By the sixth time when he reached Japan, he was already 66 years old and blind. So, for things you are determined to do, it's never too late, and no excuse.
The history of Yangzhou lacquerware can be traced back to 2,000 years ago. Song Dynasty saw the climax of Yangzhou lacquerware making. When an object is coated with lacquer, it can no longer be distinguished as being made of certain material. Therefore, all objects coated with lacquer were referred to as lacquerware. Lacquer trees are indigenous in China. That might explain the popularity of lacquerware here. The luster and gloss of lacquerware can last more than a few hundred years. So if you're interested in purchasing, remember, production from three cities are most favorable and desirable. Beijing, Fuzhou, and of course, my favorite city, Yangzhou. Yangzhou lacquerware is famous for its exquisite carving technique and also inlaid with gem, mother pearl, and jade. But it's first time for me to really understand how come it's so expensive. It takes so long time to finish, 250 days for one piece like this. But look at this, turning from a painting to a motif sculpture. That takes more than time, also mastership. And its color and luster can easily last beyond a few hundred years. So it has always been desired by Chinese upper class. Linking the northern and southern China together, the Grand Canal contributed greatly to ensure the Chinese primary economy thrived in past dynasties. By refortifying the Great Wall in the north and completing the Great Canal between the north and south, Sui laid a solid foundation for the brilliant epoch of the Tang Dynasty, as China emerged as the most powerful state in the world. Now more than 2,000 years old, some parts of the canal are still in use, some functioning as a water dimension conducts, and some sections as what of scenaric boat tour routes, especially in and around Yangzhou City. This is the nightclub I should join, right? I couldn't believe that I waited so long to visit this beautiful city. A city I read thousands of times in stories, in poets, in legends. And in reality, it is simply better. So set your expectation high. You won't be disappointed. I promise you. Even though the misty spring is always considered the best time to visit, but trust me, any time come here, you will be fine. Have a great time. I'm your host, Yan Lei. You'll be watching Travel Lock. Thanks for watching. Bye. Enjoy this breathtaking view. In the next episode, we visit the capital of the Tang Dynasty, Xi'an, during the height of ancient China.